Well, as I've already told you this morning, we're going to finish the Sermon on the the Mount, uh, Luke's um, uh, recording of it. We're going to look at the last things that our Lord Jesus says by way of application to his sermon, okay? So let's read that first, and uh, as I've already told you, it is encouragement for us to build our lives upon the rock, the rock being our Lord Jesus. So this is what we read, beginning in verse 46 of Luke chapter 6. Jesus, again, speaking to his disciples, um, not just the 12, but um, to all who were following him, uh, these words, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred and the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it, the torrent burst against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it. And immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our understanding uh, this morning. And remember, uh, these are the words of Jesus Christ. These are the words of the Son of God. The whole Bible is. So we shouldn't treat this as any other literature, although, you know, as far as its authority, but we do need to understand the plain sense of these words, even though Jesus here is giving to us basically a story, an analogy there is some significant truth behind it, and that's what we want to understand. Now, last week, uh, we saw Jesus challenged us to be fruit inspectors, if I can put it that way, uh, to look at ourselves to see if His image is actually being formed within us so that we might know whether we belong to Him. And He challenged us at the same time to look at others to know whether we should receive someone as a brother or sister in the Lord Jesus Christ or as an object of evangelism. Again, I was pointing out when Jesus said, do not judge lest you be judged, what he meant was don't criticize harshly and quickly. But he wasn't saying don't make evaluations about how people are living or what they're doing. Uh, We have to do that. We have to do that for the sake of evangelism. I mean, we have to, you know, again, look at somebody and realize that they need to be evangelized. We're not going to evangelize somebody who's professing Christ and who is doing what the Lord calls them to do. We're going to assume that they believe in Jesus. And we also have to make an evaluation regarding the teachers we're going to listen to. Uh, Are they bringing us the Word of God or are they not? So should we receive them or avoid them? And we do that by examining uh, fruits. Now, he told us that just as a tree can be known by the kind of fruit it produces, people can be known in the same way. If we bear useful fruit, if we're living as our Lord calls us to live, if we are doing good works, we show ourselves and we show others that we are good trees, useful trees, that we have been born again by the Spirit of God, that we belong to Him. This is perhaps the most powerful evidence both to ourselves and to others that we really are the Lord's, that we really are saved, and that we really will see heaven. At least it is if we're doing these things because we love the Lord. You know, we we recognize the fact that people can do things for the wrong reasons. They can do right things for the wrong reasons. That's why Jesus told us in verse 45 of his sermon, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. You know, it's what is in the heart that basically uh, is revealed outwardly. But again, we know that sometimes we can do things outwardly that may be good but aren't emanating from uh, love. So they have to be things God commands, and they have to be done out of love for Him and for His glory. So if we see that, we can know that we're a good tree we can, because we're bearing useful fruit. But if we bear useless fruit, if we're not living as the Lord calls us to live, if we're not doing the right things from the right motives, this shows that we are bad trees. We might even claim to be Christians, that we are connected to the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the analogy he gives in John chapter 15. But Jesus tells us there, if we are not bearing any good fruit... 
that the Father will eventually prune us off of the vine and we'll be removed from the church and those branches which represent the people who are making that, that profession but who really didn't know Him because there was no fruit, they were barren, are going to be gathered and cast into the fire. And that is what Jesus is warning us of again this morning. Now, whether we're saved or not is the most important question that you and I can ask ourselves in this life. Jesus was saying the things that He was saying here not to browbeat His hearers, but He wanted His hearers to be able to answer this question for themselves. And Jesus said these things not only for their sake but for ours so that we can answer this question for ourselves as well and then do what needed to be done before it's too late so that we might be safe, that we might turn from our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus as He freely offers Himself to us uh, today, this morning, in His Word through His Gospel. Now, this morning, Jesus gives us one final challenge at the end of this sermon to help us answer that question. And he also gives us one final incentive uh, to come to him. Now, first of all, he gives us one final challenge to help us see what really is in our hearts. He asks this question in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Basically, you know, you, you say one thing, you do another thing. Why are you being basically hypocritical, okay? Now, this is how every sermon obviously should end with the applicational question. Okay, Jesus speaks to us in His Word, and then He asks us the question, how are we going to respond to what it is that He has said? Now, what good is anything that Jesus actually tells us in the Word of God, what good is it going to do you and me if we never listen to Him, if we never respond, if we never believe, if we never obey? And Jesus is asking us this question, if we don't listen to Him, if we do not obey Him, what does that tell us about our relationship with Him? Well, Jesus is telling us, it tells us that, it, that He isn't our Lord, regardless of what it is we actually claim, whatever we say. Now, God tells us as plainly as He really can tell us anything in His Word, that Jesus cannot be our Savior, He is not our Savior if He isn't also our Lord. You cannot separate the two. He is both. Jesus is the Lord. That's something He actually reminded His disciples of a number of times throughout the Gospels. In John 13, verse 13, He said to His disciples, You call Me Teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. He is the Lord. Now, the fact that He is the Lord, of course, means something. It means that we are to obey Him. You know, the word Lord in the New Testament is the Greek word kurios, which is the uh, Greek equivalent of God's name, actually. Uh, God's covenant name, Yahweh, in the Old Testament. And the reason it is because in the Old Testament, this word is often translated Lord. Now, we do understand that these two words don't have the same meaning. Kurios means Lord. It means master, it means the one we are to obey. Yahweh means essentially, I am. I am the eternally existing one. Remember when Moses said, as the Lord called him to go into Egypt, they asked me what your name is, what will I tell them? You shall say, I am who I am has sent you, okay? In other words, I am the one who always has been, and I am, and I always will be. I am the unchanging one. But the word Lord is the word that the Jews most often use to translate the name Yahweh in the Old Testament Scriptures, and certainly in the Septuagint, this is the very word that they use. Okay, the Septuagint, remember, is the, essentially a Greek translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament Scriptures so that the Jews would be able to read and understand those that didn't understand Hebrew. The Jews were so afraid to speak God's name so that they would not use it in vain that whenever the word appeared in a passage as, as the reader in the synagogue was reading, he would most often say Adonai, which means Lord. Or he might say Adoshain or Hashem, which means the name. But they would not say the name of Yahweh because they did not want to say it 
in vain. Now again, uh, so kurios is the word that is used. It means Lord, which is the equivalent of Adonai in the Old Testament. Kurios does not mean Yahweh in every place in the New Testament where the word Lord is used, but it always means that when it's referring to Jesus Christ, okay? Which means that He is the covenant God of Israel, okay? He is God. He is our God, which is one of the reasons why we must obey Him because He's the Lord, right? God, the Almighty, calls us to obey and our response is, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now, Jesus is also our mediator, okay? He's the one that God sent into the world to save us, the one who was given authority as a reward for his work as the God-man. You know, the mediator is, is a human being, but the person of that human being is God. He is God and man, and we know that God has entrusted to Jesus authority, to rule over all things. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples on the mount before he ascended into heaven in Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, that this was his reward for his humiliation, becoming one with us, uh, and then suffering as he did, uh, the, the basically becoming a curse for us, dying, then being buried and, and rising again. This is what he says. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he is God, and we should obey him. He is the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. He is the God of the universe. He's the only God that exists. He is the second person of the triune God. But he is also the mediator who gets his authority as the reward for his work. And Jesus now rules and reigns over the entire universe, basically ordering and arranging everything for the good of his church and the advancement of his kingdom. And though sometimes we may question some of the things we see going on, there's a lot of evil in the world the Lord is using that evil for his good purposes because he is the one who is in control. He's not inspiring that evil, but he's using the evil that exists in our hearts for good, for his glory. And we know how he's done that in our own lives. Now, Jesus tells us in our passage that he must be master, he must be our master in more than simply name only if we are finally to enter into heaven. We actually need to obey him. He says in, in our meditation that we read earlier in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So it's not enough simply to say Jesus is Lord. We actually have to obey him. And again, as I've told you before, that is the fruit that must be there. By the way, this is just simply another way of saying something that we're used to saying within Protestant circles, that we have not really been justified, okay? We've not really been declared by God to be just, to be acceptable to Him because of the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness alone received by faith unless we are at the same time being sanctified. And that means becoming more like Jesus. That means bearing more good fruit, useful fruit, doing what Jesus says. That is the evidence that we have been justified. The Bible tells us that true faith, justifying faith, trust in Jesus, produces good works. Listen to what John the Baptist says in John 3, verse 36, as we read past, you know, John 3, 16, what Jesus says you know, for God so loved the world and so forth, John the Baptist says this, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Huh. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know, the interesting thing about this passage is the word there for believes and the word there for obey is exactly the same word in the Greek. It's the word for faith or belief or trust, pastuo. And what the uh, translators are showing us here is that 
uh, there is implied in this act of faith, this act of belief, also this act of submission. If you believe something, you're going to act on it. So this is an active and lively faith. It is a faith that produces works. That's the kind of faith that saves. Remember what James tells us in James 2.26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And the reason it is is because a saving faith always produces or works by love. Okay? It produces love for the Lord so that we want to do these things. Remember what Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That is key. Okay? That shows us again the character of saving faith. So let's just pause here for a moment and ask this question first of all. Do you believe that you're justified? Do you believe you're justified by God's grace alone, through faith alone, that is by trusting in Jesus Christ alone? Well, I hope you do. James says, if you do, you actually do well. But he also reminds us, the demons also believe and they shudder. Now, how can we know that we have a faith that is different than the faith of the demons, that we really have a saving faith? Well, we've already seen the answer to that question. We obey. We have a faith that produces obedience that because we love him. If we, if we love someone, we act on that love. And Jesus is telling us exactly the same thing. We will know that we belong to him because we're also going to find ourselves reading the Bible, reading his word to listen to the voice of our Lord when, when he speaks to us so that we might learn better how to do what our Lord actually calls us to do. Now, if that's what we're doing, the Bible says we have a living faith that justifies. But if our faith does not produce obedience, James tells us that kind of faith is worthless and it will not save us. He says in, in James 2.20, Are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, we understand that even the best Christians in the world, even the Apostle Paul, I mean, we can't really point to anybody who was flawless in the Bible except for Jesus alone. Even the best Christians are a mixed bag, okay, of good and evil. No one is perfect on this side of heaven but at the same time, there must be fruit, right? There must be some good works. There must be the desire to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about Jesus. How much of his life was made up of good fruit? How much of his life was, you know, doing good works? His whole life, except for maybe when he was sleeping. But when he was sleeping, he was still glorifying God, wasn't he? Because everything he did gave glory to God. And the question is, do we see that happening in our own lives? Is that what we see in ourselves? James tells us in James 2.26, faith without works is dead. And Jesus is telling us here that if we call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says, we are dead, okay? We need Jesus Christ. We need to trust in him. Now, Jesus doesn't stop with simply that statement. He goes on to tell us what kind of a difference it makes, whether we listen or we don't listen. Okay, so we call him Lord, Lord. We don't do what he says. What's going to happen? Well, he's going to tell us what's going to happen, but he's also going to tell us what will happen if we call him Lord, Lord, and do what he says. Okay, and that comes in verses 47 through 49. He says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who is heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it and immediately collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. I think what Jesus says here is something we all understand today. You don't build your house on top of no foundation or like a dirt foundation. We know that still goes on in the world today, but when it does and a flood comes, that's the end of the house. We need a strong foundation. Now, just, we'll just take just a moment to unpack what, what Jesus is talking about here. The word man, the man who builds one or the other, 
is, is obviously being used generically here to refer to everyone in the world, to men, to women, to boys, to girls, to all of us here this morning. The house that each of us is building refers to our lives. Okay, what are we building our lives on? What is it we're doing with the time and the energy and the resources and everything that makes up our lives? How are we living? By the flood here, Jesus means both the trials that God sends in this life to test our faith, and if we belong to him, he sends plenty of those. Okay? The idea that you just come to Christ and your worries and troubles are over, that's completely false. When you come to Christ, the struggles begin. Okay? The warfare begins. It's a hard life. So we'll be able to stand, you see, in, in that. So the, the flood is, are these trials sent to taste, test our faith, but it's also going to be the final trial when we stand before the Lord on that final day, when he tries our lives, puts us on trial, as it were. The house that stands is a picture of our ability to withstand the storms of these, light, you know, basically these trials that come in life, as well as to stand in the day of judgment. And the house that falls is a picture of our not being able to stand, either in this life or in the world to come. And what is it that makes a difference between these two houses, these two lives, one that stands and one that doesn't? Well, it is, of course, trusting Jesus, acting upon his word, both in coming to him and in following him. Jesus says if we listen to him, if we trust him, if we obey him, from the heart, we'll be safe. We'll not only be able to withstand whatever our flesh, that is our sins, our sinful desire will throw against us in this world, not only what the world is going to throw against us and the enemy of our souls, while we're in this world, we're also going to be able to stand in the day of judgment. We're going to be numbered among the sheep rather than the goats because of what Jesus has done for us. Okay, Remember, we're saved by trusting Jesus. The fruit is the evidence that we really are trusting Jesus. We'll stand on that day because we are standing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we do not listen to him, if we really don't trust him, and we really don't love him, and so we're not living according as he calls us to live, we will not be safe. Not only will our enemies attack us and overcome us in this life, we won't be able to stand in the judgment, but will be cast like the branches into the fiery furnace. And let me just point this out. It's becoming, I think, more, perhaps more in vogue today. It's certainly universal among Christian cults that there is no hell, that basically there's only annihilation, you know, annihilationism. It's, today it's called conditional immortality, the idea that we're all basically mortal and God has to give us immortality and we'll be given immortality if we trust in Jesus, but if we don't trust in Jesus, when he throws us into the lake of fire, into the fiery furnace, we're just poof, you know, we'll be annihilated, we're gone. That's not what the Bible teaches. We will be cast into the fiery furnace, not to be destroyed in the sense that we're burned up, but to be tormented, first in soul before Jesus comes, and then in soul and body for the rest of eternity because we cannot come out of there until we have paid our full debt to God's justice, which because our sins are committed against an infinitely holy God, can never be satisfied by us. That's the reason why Jesus had to be God and man to suffer on the cross. His payment had to be enough to fully satisfy God's justice. Well, the problem is our suffering could never satisfy it, and that's why it goes on forever and ever. So if we don't trust Jesus, if we don't obey him, the fruit of our true trust and our true love, we won't be safe. We are in danger of this very thing. So Jesus asks us this morning from this application at the end of his sermon, do you want to know that you are actually safe? The only way you can is by building your life on a firm foundation, and that is upon Jesus Christ. You need to turn from your sins. You need to trust in him which means not just believe the facts about Jesus, that he lived and died and rose again and that everyone who trusts in him is saved, but actually to uh, rely on him as your hope of acceptance with the Father. You have to trust him to get you into heaven through his work 
and not your work. That's what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have an active faith. And then, as Jesus reminds us here this morning, if that's what you're doing, you will follow Him. That's the evidence that you really are trusting Him, is that you love Him and you want to follow Him. You want to do what He says. It's not that somebody's putting the screws to you and so much pressure on you that you have to conform. That kind of obedience is not obedience. But you're doing it because you really want to, because you love Him. Now, if you are trusting Him and obeying Him, following Him because you love Him, you are safe. Again, the table of the Lord reminds you of that this morning. Jesus died so you wouldn't have to die. He gave His life for your life so that you might be saved, that I might be saved, that we might go to heaven. And that's why the table of the Lord also is only uh, for those who have trusted Jesus. But if you haven't trusted Jesus and you're not obeying Jesus, you're not safe. But you can be if you will put your faith and, tr and trust in Christ, if you will trust in Him this morning and take up His cross and begin to follow Him. So Jesus asks you again, which, which road are you on this morning? You know, get on the narrow road. It's, it's only through Christ, only through Jesus that you can be saved. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard.